great to have you here this morning. We pray today that you will leave here saying it was good for you to be here. Not just for us to have you, but for you to be here in the presence of God. And no matter what you're facing today, no matter what the world says, no matter what your parents have said, no matter what your friends say, this song speaks about what God says and who God says you are. He says you are strong. He says you're an overcomer. He says you are his and he loves you today. So listen as his words speak about what our Father says about us. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never Just the sum of every high and day. 
face obstacles, you're the one who's bigger. You're the one who's greater. No matter how big it may seem to us, God, it's pretty small compared to who you are. So, God, right now, we lift our hands all across this place for whatever need we have. We bring it towards you, God, whether it be spiritual, emotional, physical. We bring it to you right now. We ask you, God, to be the meter of our needs. God, to sustain us, to hold us, to be our portion. When we feel weak, you are made strong. When we feel like we can't rise up, you bring us the rest of the way. You heal us. You save us. You change us. You are our healer. For that, God, we are thankful today. Lord, I pray, touch those lives. Heal them. Restore them. Be their healer. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. Okay, thanks for coming to our friend tryouts. Uh, we just have a few questions to see if you'd be a good match for us. If you could date one of our mothers, which would you date? Have you ever been to prison? You know that one thing you did that one time with that one person? Why did you do that? You got any yo mama jokes? Do you think Jesus was good at bowling? I don't suppose you could teach us how to Dougie, per se, but could you teach us how to knit? Where do babies come from? Be specific. Sing your favorite air supply song. Do you believe in corporal punishment? How much time do you spend skipping when no one is looking? So from like one to needy, where do you fall? Did you lie about liking Celine Dion music back in 1995? Do you hear voices in your head? I don't, I don't think so, no. All right, so here's the statement that you're gonna hear over the next several weeks. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. New series that we're starting over the next several weeks called Friending, where we're going to be evaluating not just who our friends are, but how we are as a friend. Who are we as the people that we call our friends? So we're going to be going lots of different discussions, having lots of different uh, discoveries. Uh, see, if you get the right friends and they set you up in the right place, you will have great success. You get the wrong friends doing the wrong things, they will destroy your life. And all the parents who know this to be true should give me a big, loud amen. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Young people, this message is for all of us, but this is message especially for you at your young age of life. I wish this message would have been spoken to me when I was young because it would have challenged my thoughts about who I call my friends. Here's what, here's what Proverbs said, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. Here's what he said in Proverbs 13, 20. He says, Walk with the wise and become what? Wise. Walk with the wise and what? Become wise. become wise. But a companion of fools, what happens? They suffer harm. harm. Walk with the wise, hang with wise people, hang with smart people, hang with people that are doing wise things, and you too will go down that path of wisdom. Or walk with idiots, knuckleheads, rum dums, whatever you want to call them, you will be just like them. The better that they are, the wiser they are, the smarter they are, they will compel you to be smarter, wiser, and better yourself. But if you hang with the party people, you go with the people that drink and get drunk and get smoke and get high, you go down that path, I promise you, your life will go down that path as well. Because you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Show me who your friends are, I will show you your future by just looking at your friends. I don't have to even know what you do. I have to know what they do, and I will show you what your future is. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Throughout my life, I've been blessed with many different friends. Not friends for just seasons, but friends for generations. Generational friends. Friends that have been my friends for next to 20 years. 
Friends that have been beside me and through me through thick and thin has saw me and prayed with me, and I too have done for them throughout the hardest, most challenging obstacles of life. Why? Because they have been so good, and I have been trying to do my best to be good to them as friends. A man named Roger, a man named Tim, a man named Rex Borman, one of my first pastors. Uh, Kingsley Walker, one of my, when I was first youth pastor, a good friend of mine. Pastor Howe Santos out in St. Louis, good friend of mine. Pastor Terry here, Pastor Joe, Pastor Chris. So many good friends throughout my life that are not just friends for seasons, but friends for life. Friending is so important. Why is it important? Because Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9 says this, two are better than one, and a three-stranded cord cannot be broken. Two are better than one. Three-stranded cord cannot be broken. When your friends are friends and when they stick together through thick and thin and when they're supporting one another and they're lifting each other up, there's nothing you can do because of the power of friendship. So on your notes, if you got them when you came in, if you didn't, you can do this exercise without your notes, but I put on there, I want you right now in the next 15 seconds, give me the first five friends in your life. I want you to write down the names of five Friends in your life. You can't include your spouse. Nope. Can't include your spouse. That's a given. You can't include your kids because they're friends today and probably not tomorrow and probably friends the next day. Who knows? They're all over the place. Can't include your kids. These have to be friends beyond your immediate home. Siblings I'll give to you because not all siblings can be considered friends. But I want you to think about what are the five friends you have in your life? Who are they? Because here's the, here's the sociological average. Whatever five friends you have, you're going to be the average of all of them. So if you have friends who are very good with money and some that aren't so good with money, you're going to be right in the middle of the average of okay with money. If your marriage is, is uh, you, you have a friends that their marriage is great, and you have other friends, their marriage is not so good, you're going to be kind of right in the middle. You're the average of whatever your friends are, sociologists say. So who are you running with? If your friends are pursuing Christ and desiring Christ and passionate about Christ and stand strong for Christ and don't compromise, you will be the average of that friend. If none of your friends stand for Christ, and you say, well, I stand for Christ a little bit, well, good for you. I'm proud of you for that. But maybe you need to find some friends that are a little stronger in their faith that stand stronger for Christ. Because you become those you run with. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. It brings us to this question. Are you hanging with the right people? It's interesting that I can preach this message to teenagers, I can preach it to adults, and we all have to ask the same question. Am I hooked up, am I connected, am I friends with the right kinds of people? Are they improving my life? Do I feel better after hanging with my friends, or do I feel worse? Now, I don't mean do you feel better because you look at how miserable they are, and you go, well, I'm better than them. Sometimes that's why we have friends, right? Just to feel better, because they suck. Man, they're horrible at that. I'm better, so I feel better about myself. You're like, what? You're crazy. Okay, we all do that. Just come on. We're kind of like, we like other people's misery at times. It makes us feel better about our own misery. You say, well, that's wrong. It is wrong, but it's the human condition. Can we get real today? That's right, right? Friends are something. Are they better than you? Think about it. In every area of your life, who are the people you're running with? Are they stronger financially? Are they stronger spiritually? Are they stronger in their marriage? Are they in better shape? Do they push you to get exercising? Or do they leave you looking like a Twinkie? What do they do? Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. You're the average of the closest people that are clo your closest friends. So today's message, we're going to define what friendship is. We're going to set a foundation. What is friendship. Well, here's what Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17 says in the FBV version, Facebook version. This is what Facebook version says a friend is. 
A friend is someone you may or may, know, may not know who, who accepts your friend request on Facebook. This person is born to like and comment your posts and to make you feel good about yourself. Think about your Facebook friends. Are they really your friends? No, I have 500 Facebook friends, but you couldn't put five friends on your piece of paper just now. Facebook friends means nothing. Not talking about the digital friends out there that you that say good job or a smiley face or a heart when you put something on. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the people connected in your life in real time. Here's what Proverbs says. Proverbs 17, 7 in the real translation says, a friend loves at all times and a brother or sister is born for a time of adversity. This says that a friend loves at all times. How many times? How many times? Come on. All times. Whether good or bad, whether you did right or you did wrong, they love you at all times. And when you go through the fire, and when you get hit with something out of right field, and it just knocks you the breath out of you, whenever you go through that, a friend is someone who doesn't leave you, doesn't abandon you, doesn't say, you got it, you're on your own. No, a friend is the one who comes beside you and cries with you and, and walks with you and picks you up. And when you fall, they fall with you and they help get back up. A friend is a friend. No matter what the times come, they are there. And sadly... In our world today, we don't know this type of friendship. We've lost the art of being good friends and therefore having good friends. I'm not talking about a friend for a season. I'm talking about a friend for generations. Not, I'm talking about friends that they're friends and they have kids and you have kids and then your kids get married and they have kids and you're still friends with them. Generations. It's a very foreign concept in our world today, but it's a very godly concept because it's what helps us through the difficulties of life. 25 years ago, studies say, an average person could write down six friends, and they would be close friends. They'd be friends that they could call up in a heartbeat. They'd be friends they could stop into their house anytime they wanted. They wouldn't be annoyed. They'd be friends that they could call up and say, hey, can you help me side my house? And they would be there in a heartbeat ready to contribute and give. 25 years ago, six friends. Today, two, if there's two. What's happened? What's happened to our world? Now, listen, I know we want to blame everything on COVID. Well, COVID happened. Listen, this dynamic was happening long before COVID. This dynamic has been taking place in our culture for many years. What's some of the reasoning for it? I have three thoughts I want to give you. Write this down in your notes. If you're taking them, write this down. Three thoughts. First one is this. Increasing work hours. What's sad is that in the, even in the months that we had, we, we were able to work from home, but we were unable to connect in a physical, visual way. So in the last several months, we not only have lost coworkers as friends, uh, even though we're doing it through Zoom, we're doing it digitally, it's not the same. Church, think about church. We shut church down. We closed the doors. We said, worship with us online. And while you know, we do the best we can and you do the best you can and try to connect, nothing can substitute this, the meeting together in this place. Whether you talk to each other or not, there's something about coming together and looking at people and going, oh, look at them. Oh, they look good. Oh, man, I, I remember when we were in a small group together with them. I remember whenever we used to do life together. And you start thinking about and, resent, and remembering all those times of community, doing life together. Increasing work hours have struggled with us. Our shift hours, our night shifts, and our different shifts we have going on. That's the first one. Second thought is this. Friendships have declined because of divorce rates. 
the rising divorce rates that are taking place. When a divorce happens, it not just shakes a family's foundation, but it also causes, has a cause and effect. You don't go to the lawyer, you go to the lawyer, whenever you get a divorce, you negotiate property. You don't negotiate friends, but friendship is an aftermath effect of that. And that rising cost happens, and so friends pick their ways. He's right, she's right, he's wrong, she's wrong, and all of a sudden, there's a divide, there's a breakdown, and friends disappear. Number three, work hours, divorce rates. Number three, the explosion of social media. Now, I know you all knew I was going to get on social media. You all knew I was going to talk about it. But I want to shed some light on social media. I want you guys to know that I am not anti-social media. I feel like social media has a place. However, we have, we have used social media to replace relationships that really social media should only enhance relationships we have with each other already. For example, my family does not live anywhere near us, and so throughout the years, social media has been a great platform to be able to connect with my family, extended family, who don't live locally through pictures and through stories and through uh, letting people know about what's going on. However, it didn't replace my relationship with my parents. I didn't stop having a relationship with my parents because I was on social media, but yet that's what we do. Think about yourself. Whenever I was young, we had this thing called a telephone. You had to pick it up. You had to actually manually dial it. It was exhausting. You had to work to get a phone call. The rotary dials, oh my gosh. I mean, it took forever to dial. And if it was long distance, baby, you were in trouble. It took you longer to make the call than to have the call, right? Remember whenever you had to worry about long distance rates, everybody? You remember that? I remember growing up, my family didn't have a whole lot of money, and my grand, all my grandparents lived long distance. Even though it was in St. Louis, it was long distance. I know it's unheard of. Our young people don't even know what long what does long distance mean. They think long distance is like going across around the world. We're talking next state over. It was long distance, right? You guys remember that? And it was it was high to call. It was expensive to call. And so my family, my my dad, they had the system, and they would call and let the phone ring once and hanged up. And then my grandparents would call back because they could afford to make the phone call. We couldn't, right? Oh, those were the days. But even in my growing up days, you know, I would never, I would never call up a, a friend and say, hey, Billy, guess what I'm having for breakfast today? <laughs> I'm having some toast and bacon. You all laugh because you know it's true. <laughs> hey, Billy, guess what? My bowel movement is really good today. <laughs> or here's one. Having a great day! <laughs> That's when it's all caps. <laughs> You know who you are, all cap person. <laughs> Stop with the caps. You can say, okay, take the cap lock off. It looks like you're yelling at me every time I read you. Like, what I do? <laughs> Think about it. And, and, you know, we had to work. Hey, Billy, you want to go out and play today? You want to get together and go do something? I did not have a friend named Billy. It's just the quickest name I can come up with, but... <laughs> Son. And he's like, let me ask my mom. Oh, great. He's going to ask his mom now. Mom's going to say no. Yeah, I can't come today. I'm grounded. <laughs> hey, Johnny, can you go out today? I mean, you went through a Rolodex, right? Till you found the friend that would go do something with you, right? Now, I know what you guys are saying. All you young people go, that's so old school. You had to talk to people. <laughs> we had to talk to people. I hear of young people doing full relationships through text. I'm going, how do you know? 
he may talk like a girl. How do you know what he sounds like? <laughs> right? Crazy. Online pictures and we share and we fake it up. We take filters and we snap pictures 30 times to find the right one. And then we slide the filters in the right place and put it out there because we, they're our friends, but we got to look perfect. Listen, they're not your friends. They're people that you requested, accept me, accept me. I got accepted. I'm accepted by 500 people that will never see me. Yay. Right? How messed up is it? Is it not just really messed? When you think about it, it's really messed up. It's dysfunctional. Because we have all these people that we share our lives with online, but yet the people sitting next to us doing life with us, our coworkers, or the people who are closest to us, our family and our friends, they don't have a clue what's going on because we never share anything with them. We try to connect with all these virtual people, but never connecting with the people that are actually in the room. Social media should supplement or enhance a relationship, but it should never replace a relationship. We're going to talk next week about one friend away, how we can reach out to friends around us. Next, we're going to talk about our community of friendship that we have here. Even in the middle of COVID, we can have great friends right here at Crossview. And then the last week, we're going to talk about unfriending. It's very hard. But there is a truth today. There's some of our friends, they're not good for us. They're not enhancing our relationship. They're definitely not drawing us closer to God. They're, in fact, distancing us, and we need to make some decisions about unfriending. So today, I want to give you two thoughts about setting a foundation of friendship. Here's the two thoughts. I could give you a lot more, but I'm only summarizing it with two. Here's how we build the foundation of a great friendship. Number one, we must be present we must literally be present in the room at the time that the relationship is taking place. I want to develop friendships with people face to face, not thumb to thumb. And definitely not belly to belly, that's only for married people. Some of you will get that in a minute. I want to develop friendships face to to face. I don't like connecting with people through text. I'll do it if people are busy. I'll do it for their convenience. But man, there's nothing better than a good old-fashioned phone call. There's nothing better, even in our world today, than, believe this or not, an old-fashioned handwritten letter. We have individuals in the church that, to this day, still send us greeting cards, encouragement cards, and they're handwritten, and they're just saying words of encouragement to me, and man, I savor those. They're becoming fewer and fewer. But see, a good friend is present. A good friend is like Jesus did with the disciples. Jesus didn't send out a tweet. Okay, listen, I'm, um, I'm setting up a group of guys. We're going to change the world. Oh, that's 140. I got to send it. Okay. All right. Next one. All right. Now, we're going to change the world. Whoever wants to join me, come and meet me by the Sea of Galilee, 2 p.m. today. Send. Didn't do that. Jesus walked with the people. He walked. He saw some guys cleaning their nets. He walked up to Peter and said, hey, Peter, drop your nets. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers and men. Jesus invested in 12 men lives. And let me tell you, these men were not perfect. These men were flawed. These men failed. The one of the men, if you remember the story, Judas sold him to the Pharisees. This, Jesus did not have perfect friends because there's no such thing as a perfect friend. You're not a perfect friend. They're not perfect friends. But a friend is there at all times, and they're born for adversity. When you go through the struggles, they're the ones you call on. They're the ones you stick to. They're the ones that will encourage you. They're the ones that will pick you up. Jesus said, come follow me. Come do life. It's not going to be easy. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to at times suffer. You're going to struggle. 
But trust me, Jesus said, I will be your friend forever. Jesus showed us the perfect example of being present. If Jesus was born in our day and time, he would, he would probably look at it the way that I think a lot of us do, and that is there is a beauty or there is an uh, uh, enrichment with social media, with electronics, but there's also a distraction. Parents, you set the example. You want your kids to pick good friends? Be sure you're picking good friends. You want your kids to not do drugs? Make sure you're not doing drugs. You're not smoking weed because, well, it's legal in Illinois now. We can go ahead and smoke it. No? You don't want your kids to do it? You don't do it. Your language... Parents, you set the bar. Your friends set the bar. You tell your friends, if you set the example, you say there's no cussing in my house. Your friends will respect you enough to do that, hopefully, and your kids see the example you set. It's interesting that I think a lot of times as parents where we fail is not in what we teach our kids, it's what we do that we teach otherwise. You know, all my parents, please hear me. I'm not trying to offend, just trying to be truthful. It's do what I say, don't do what I do. And yet, ultimately, our kids are watching what we do more than what we say because they want to know it's true. Show me your friends. I'll show you your future. When you get around the dinner table, I'm going to encourage you parents when you get around your dinner table, be present with your kids. The work can wait for 15 minutes to have dinner, 30 minutes. Put your phones in another room. Get them away from you. Don't be distracted by them. Be present in the room. How many times I've walked in on teenagers and they're all sitting on the couches and they're all sitting around. I look around them. They're all on their phones. They're all doing this. I said, what are you guys doing? Hanging out. I'm like, who are you hanging out with? Each other. I'm like, really? Are you texting each other while you're sitting right here? No, I'm talking. I'm looking on social media. Or I'm, I'm out someplace else. You're not present. Be present in the room. Be present. Dad, mom, set the example. Show the kids what it means to be present. Be present. Hebrews says it this way. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another towards acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect, the scripture also says, let us not neglect of meeting together, grabbing, having relationship together, as some people do, but to encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let us encourage one another to come together, to have relationships, to grow deeper in our passion with Christ. The scripture says where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. So whether you're in a car or whether you're on a plane or whether you're in a small group or whether you're in an office place or whether you're uh, out, in the, out in public at the park, whether you're at a grocery store, if you find a friend and a friend is going through hard times, it does not bother you one iota to be able to stand right there and say, can I pray with you? And right there in the middle of the dessert aisle, of bakery, of produce, whatever it is, you're praying. Why? Because your friend needs it. If you want good friends, you must be a good friend. The problem is we want loyalty at times, but yet we at times are very disloyal to the friend's that are closest to us. We talk about them behind their back. We talk about the, their annoyances that they have with us. And let me just tell you, the friends are annoying. My good friend is uh, uh, Hal Santos. And maybe you don't know who he is, but some of you do. My former pastor at the church where I was at, still my good friend, talks to me. We talk on a weekly basis. But he annoyed me. He annoys me. He's an early riser. He wakes up so early. 
And when we lived in St. Louis, he thought it was his, his obligation to be the alarm clock for my house. And he would call at 5.30 in the morning with sleeping kids to go walking. <laughs> Annoyed me. But he's my good friend. I love the guy. When he goes through times, when I go through times, I'll get a phone call without him knowing. And he'll say, how you doing? I'll say, I'm okay. He'll say, yeah, I feel the same way. We'll talk. Just this past week, he called me. He's entering into his retirement years. Been at a church for 30 six years. He's looking at what he's going to do with the next part of his life. He calls me and I could tell he was discouraged. He was trying to figure things out. I listened to him talk. I asked him a few questions. And then I said, can I pray with you? And he started crying on the other end of the line. He said, that's my friend. A friend is present. A friend is there. A friend is there whenever you need him the most. As a man, I have struggles that my wife will never understand, nor would I ever try to weigh upon her or lay upon her the struggles that I have as a man. But I have friends, men friends, that I can talk to and very directly say, I'm struggling this, and they say, let's pray. Friend is a friend who is born for all times, born for adversity. There's something special about friends, real friends, not Facebook, fake book friends, real friends that go deep. Here's what the next one is. Not only be present, but the second thought I have for you is this. Be open. Be transparent. Be real. Talk about phobias. Talk about your anxieties. Talk about your fears. Talk about... The, the struggles you have with your greatest friend and let them know that, that you're hurting, that you're struggling, and they will prayerfully encourage you and lift you up. You know, there is a, and I've talked about this before, lots of different phobias that have come into the world today. In fact, they're diagnosing new phobias every single day, new phobias they're coming up with. I don't know how much of them are true. I don't know how much of them are real. Science would say they're absolutely true. Some of them I just honestly think it's just a way that people can excuse away their behavior. Okay, that's just me. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not as smart as them. Apparently, they're very smart. I'm not. But I think it's sometimes it's an excuse just to flip away. Well, I have this problem. No, you're just a baby. Grow up. <laughs> right? You all know what I'm talking about. And, but they had this, they came up with this, this phobia that is the fear of talking on the phone. It's called, it's called telephonophobia. And it's why when your phone rings, you know, oh, come on, I'm going to hit a lot of nerves right now. That phone rings and you look at it because caller ID has saved us from a lot of conversation we didn't want to have, right? And you go, oh, no, boom, done. Telephonophobia. It's the fear of of being talked and not knowing what to say when you're talked to. Telephonophobia. I also think there's one called return odorophobia. <laughs> Whenever you get your meal wrong at a restaurant, you know, and your kids look at it and they're pouting because it wasn't made the way they're supposed to be made. I want to take it back. We'll take it up there and tell them, I can't, I can't, I can't, they're, they'll kill me. Wrong odor motophobia. I just made that up, and you all think it's real. It's not. I made it up. Totally fake. Lily, did we ever take your food up for you? Nope. Lily had to take it up or eat it like it came. We're horrible parents. There's a communication deficiency, honestly, in our world. And today was just a set of foundation. We need to be present in the relationships that mean the most to us. We need to be open and transparent to those relationships and allow God to nurture us through them. James 5, 6, confess your sins to one another and whenever uh, to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
How do we get healing? We confess, we get open, and we say, this is where I'm struggling, this is what I'm going through. The challenge or the problem is in our world today, we don't have those relationships because we don't build them with inside the church. It's why view groups are so vitally important. It's why small groups of people getting together, doing life together is so important. Because when I go through hard times, when I struggle, I have to know I have a brother who is there for me in adversity. I have people come to me all the time. And they say, Pastor, can you pray for me? And I love praying for people and I, I'll be there for them, but I can't be their friend at times. They have to find that person to connect with, to do life together. Here's what makes me afraid, Pastor Kevin, or Kevin. Here's my fears, Kevin. My friend on the phone the other day, here's my struggles. I'm entering into that place of life where I have to figure out what to do with the next part of my life and I don't know what to do. Here's my temptations. Here's my heartbreaks. Here's my pains. Here's my cries at night. Listen, we may impress people with our strengths, but we connect with people with our weaknesses. We may impress people with our strengths, we connect with people through the expression of our weakness. Because when I am weak, he is made strong. And the power that that takes place in only happens face to face, real life. Young people, I'm gonna challenge you with something. Listen up to me very carefully, young people. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to stop texting so much and start doing some phone calls. <gasps> can't do it. I mean, I have to talk with them and like come up with a conversation off the top of my head. I can't, I can't type it out, then delete and type it out and delete and type it out, then it's in. No, I want you to come up with unfiltered, unguarded, unrehearsed communication. It'd be the healthiest thing for you. Our kids, our generations today cannot handle conflict resolution because they don't know how to talk. They shut down and then they go blast them on social media. And it, it, it really is true. And you know what's sad? I see parents do it too. That's even more sad. Because what are the kids gonna do? They're gonna follow the example. Be present, be open. Show me your friends, I'll show you the future. Bow your heads with me today. Father God, help us today to be able to, to see who you've created us to be. You've created us to be something more than just friends through social media. You created us to be something more than just a, a wave high across the street. You created us to have real relationship, God. No matter if we say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a people person. I, Every one of us, God, you created us. It was you who said it is not good for us to be alone. So therefore, God, we ask you, teach us how to be good friends. Teach us how we can be a good friend to the people who are closest, how we can pray with them, how we can care for them, how we can ask them, hey, What's going on in your life? What are you struggling with? How can I pray with you? With head bowed and eyes closed today. You know, this is a different kind of response I want to give today, but when I asked you a little while ago, I asked you, write down five friends and you couldn't think of one or two. That's okay if you have one or two. I hope you have one or two. But ask yourself the question, are you the best friend that that one or two or that five could have? Do you make that friendship better? Do you bring strength to it? Do you, do you enhance it? Or is there strife, is there bickering, is there tension? There's uneasiness. Do you have the freedom in that relationship to ask your friend, hey, what's going on in your world? And I don't want the, 
the, the pat answer, oh, it's all good. I want to know, hey, what can I pray with you about? How can I be a good friend to you today? Every single one of you can do it. Every single one of you in this place can do it. Be a good friend to those friends who are closest to you and watch how God will enhance your relationships. With your head bowed and eyes closed, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray that we would be good friends, and then we're going to pray for our friends. Can we do that right now? Father God, help us to be good friends. Help us to evaluate our own personal walk so that, God, we may encourage the lives of those friends around us. And secondly, God, we're going to pray for our friends. I want you to think of your friends right now. Would you just right there in the quietness of this moment, would you just begin to lift their names up before God and just ask God to touch them, ask God to touch their life, ask God to heal them, to direct them, to, to bless them, to watch over them. Just right now, pray for your friends right now. Father, help us to be a good friend. And we ask you to touch our friends and strengthen them. That God, you would let us be a light into their life. And God, in return, they're a light to us. Every day, let us be better and better and better at friending those closest to us. I thank you, God, for your goodness. I thank you for being our friend. You, Jesus, are our greatest friend who walks with us no matter what we face. You are truly one who sticks by us no matter what we fail at, no matter how far we fall. You're right there with us, God, every step of the way. We thank you for that, Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you watch over us and help us to evaluate our friends this week, help us to evaluate our relationships, help us to be present, to be open, and allow you, God, to enrich our lives with amazing people doing life together with us. And everybody said... Amen.